You know, I would ask you <clears throat> the same question that I asked you a couple of years ago, and that is, um, why do you hold on, as it seems to me you do, hold on almost for dear life to a kind of optimism, despite all the things that, uh, that you see and comment on in front of you? Why not recognize the situation for what it is, as you describe it so well, and then perhaps point ourselves in a different direction? Down the same road. There Maybe is no different direction down that road. Don't kid yourself. There just is no different direction down that road. This isn't a strange road. We, you and I, who have been lucky enough to have been born in a free society, take freedom for granted as if it's a natural phenomenon. But let me ask you, what fraction of the human race today lives in free societies? Tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. Over history, what fraction at any moment of time ever lived in free societies? Even tinier. Even tinier. I'm leading you down the garden path, Professor Friedman. No, Go you're ahead. not. No, you're not. It is true that the, that the normal condition of mankind is tyranny and misery. We've escaped. We've been extraordinarily fortunate to escape into an island of freedom and prosperity. If we do not maintain that island of freedom and prosperity, if we do not maintain the essential features of the society which made that freedom and prosperity possible, there isn't a wide range of alternatives. We go to misery and tyranny to the normal state of mankind. Why am I optimistic? Because we're all so ignorant. If we could really predict the future, <laughs> you couldn't be optimistic. But we've seen in, historically, time and again, that people who have tried to make long-range predictions have not been very good at it. The human race is a funny thing. It's always turning up surprises on you. People are capable of doing things you wouldn't have expected to them, of rising to the circumstance. And I suppose I maintain my optimism partly because my innate character is optimistic, but partly because the consequences of not recognizing our state of affairs, of not acting in time to check it, seem to me so horrendous that I cannot but believe that as people realize the alternative before them, they won't take measures to make sure it doesn't happen. Well, what took us into this uh, little island of time in which we're so different or have enjoyed a difference well, from all the history very, of mankind? That's a very interesting question, and it's one that can be spread more broadly. It's a subject I've been very much interested in. From time to time in man's history, there have been golden ages. 5th century B.C. in Greece, the uh, Renaissance in Italy, First Elizabethan period in England, the 19th century in Britain. We're in the midst of what I regard as a golden age in the United States, 19th and early 20th century. Now, the interesting question is, how is it here, take, take, to take it out of our own context, here's the, Pelopone uh, the, the Greek peninsula. I refer to it as Peloponnesian, and somebody reminded me I should not, that it's, what is it? It's a different peninsula. At any rate, the area where Greece is. We'll accept it as such. Okay. It was the same people there in the 6th century B.C. and in the 5th century B.C. The same people in the 4th century as in the 5th century. Why is it in the 5th century you had this sudden flowering, this enormous, late, productive, and brilliant period that disappears in the 4th, 3rd, 2nd century B.C.? Why is it the same people? Well, I think... In many ways, the fundamental explanation, and now I'm simplifying and conjecturing this isn't a solid, well-sustained hypothesis, is that some accident comes along which wipes the slate clean of restraints that have been holding people back. In our own golden age, it's very clear what that was. It was a new continent with new people coming, with a new form of government, with the uh, Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, it was a uh, opportunity in which people were unrestrained and in which the natural instincts for people to improve their lot were given freest and fullest reign. Now what happens, and the reason these golden ages tend to be relatively brief, the reason they last 100 years, 150 years at most, is that as time passes, the slate gets filled up. It's very much easier to introduce restrictions and restraints than it is to remove them. It's easier to pass a law than it is to repeal a law. And so over the course of time, you tend to impose these chains and restraints on yourselves, mostly for good reasons. The initial objectives are always good. That doesn't mean the outcome is. And finally, 
the slate becomes so filled up, if I may continue to use that image, that there's no more room to write on. And you need somehow something which will provide for another removal of restraints. What do you think would provide now for a tabula rasa, again, a wiping clear of the, of the slate? Well, I think the first thing that's necessary to wipe clear the slate is to, is to set a limit to government spending. The thing that has been encroaching more and more upon that slate is that whereas until 1928 or 9, total government spending in the United States, federal, state, and local, never exceeded 10% of our income, except in the Civil War and the First World War, it has now risen to over 40% of our income. If that continues, we're through. We're uh, 40 percent is an awful lot. In Britain now, it's reached somewhere between 50 and 60 percent. If that, and the first necessity, I think, as a tactical matter, is to set an end to that. As a strategic matter, the main necessity is to is to have a change in the intellectual climate of opinion, which will substitute a belief, an individual responsibility, for the false belief in social responsibility. Now let me emphasize, the problems that have arisen to us have not come from evil people who were trying in a conspiracy or anything like that to uh, enslave us. That hasn't been our problem. Our problems have arisen from good people who are trying to do good, but trying to do good in a fundamentally flawed way. The welfare state is in many ways a noble construct, a noble concept. It's the concept that we ought to help our fellow men. The, what flaws it is that it's one thing for you to help me out of your pocket. It's another thing for you to help me out of his pocket. And the fundamental flaw of the welfare state, in my opinion, is the idea that you should do good with somebody else's money. Now, what's wrong with that? Two things are wrong. First place. Nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. We talked about New York City about seven or eight years ago. I've forgotten exactly when it was. Kenneth Galbraith, in an article in the New York Magazine, said there were no problems in New York that could not be solved by, by the city spending enough money. Uh, if I, my memory serves me right, he said by doubling New York's budget. Well, in the meantime, New York's budget is quadrupled, and the problems have gotten worse, not better. And that's cause and effect. Because when you say spend more money, whose money? The city of New York spent more money, but where did it get it? From its citizens. There was no more money in total to be spent. But nobody spends somebody else's money as careful as he spends his own. So you had more money being spent carelessly and less money being spent carefully. In the second place, equally important, you cannot spend somebody else's money unless you first get it. How do you get it? Ultimately and fundamentally by sending a policeman to take it away from him. So the concept of doing good with somebody else's money has force or coercion built into it as an essential feature. And those flaws, the waste which arises out of spending somebody else's money and the coercion which is unavoidable, destroy the good in the idea of doing good and convert it into doing bad.